Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Patrick Paul Oswald Paul, president of the society, and I'm delighted. This is a big night for us. Um, have the Barrington lecture tonight. Um, so the winner this year is Pierce Daly, and he's from the central bank, but also uh, working uh, working in the um, in UCD, or doing his PhD in UCD, I should say. Um, so really the proceedings for today are um, just to hear the paper, and then I will moderate Q&A as, as we go forward, uh, and you'll be able to do that live, I'll, I'll moderate. Um, so the topic, uh, and then at the end, we'll present the medal, most importantly, the, 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 the money. Um, and we have that as well. Um, so uh, without further ado, then, um, I'll allow Pierce work away. So it's, as you see on your screen, it's Institutional Investment Housing Financialization 2.0 in the case of Ireland. So I'll let uh, Pierce uh, present you. Hi, everybody, um, both people here and, and at home. Many thanks for attending. Um, so yeah, as Paul mentioned, I'm, I'm currently at the, the ECB, um, where I recently joined the Central Bank of Ireland. And um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm currently doing my uh, doctorate at UCD. And uh, this is one of three uh, research papers uh, that, that I'm leading there. And I should say, uh, yeah, it's been conducted in an academic capacity rather than a professional one. So just add the disclaimer that and um, this isn't uh, pertaining to central bank work. And uh, yeah, the, any errors are obviously, obviously my own and any views are my own. Um, so. so, so just to give you a, a, an initial outline, and um, I'll briefly discuss the motivation, though I think many people will be aware of what the, the overall motivation for this topic is. And um, we'll discuss some of the existing literature in the area, the data and methodology uh, I employ in the, in the presentation. And um, then I'll discuss some results and, uh, and, and then a brief kind of discussion of key takeaways and um, conclusions, uh, particularly around policy relevance. And um, so really the motivation for this is that internationally uh, and here in Ireland, we've seen a, a significant increase in, in investment of real estate for institutional investors in the past decade. So, by institutional investors, what I mean is, say, large financial firms, particularly investment funds, real estate investment trusts, and uh, private equity firms, these, these type of companies. Um, however, in the last few years, a growing share of that has been directed um, towards housing, at least here in Ireland, and, and for broader periods in, in other countries. And many authors said uh, this has been deemed this a transformation of housing into an asset class. So what, what's become known as financialization 2.0, particularly in political economy literature. And I'll explain this concept of housing financialization in a bit more detail in a few minutes, but I just kind of need to take a broader view of, of, of the, really the motivation here is, this is a highly debated topic as we all know, um, particularly here in Ireland in the past few years in the context of our ongoing housing shortage. Um, and particularly, it's, it's raised a lot of questions around the extent to which these investors had to supply, whether they impact rents, whether they impact house prices. Um, however, really, uh, aside from data from the CSO to a certain extent, uh, and, and also uh, particularly from industry bodies, we have very little information on this. So, so really, this, this, this data gap is, is, our, is our key constraint. And ultimately, it's that data gap that, that I try to uh, close somewhat with this paper, and in doing so, to add some uh, new nuances to kind of the, the our understanding really of the topic. So uh, I do this really by trying to answer a number of questions. Firstly, confirming if there has indeed been a shift towards housing by institutional investors in Ireland. If so, um, you know, is this has this been directed towards the existing housing stock? Is that what they're acquiring, or are they financing and building new supply? Um, and additionally, then where are these units located? This is this is important in terms of trying to think about these, these kind of questions in terms of like uh, if they're impacting prices, if they're impacting rents, if they're concentrated in a specific area, maybe that increases the potential for that. Uh, who are the investors? 
that this is also an important point. Um, and then whether they could impact prices, whether they could impact rents. So I tried to touch on all of these aspects. So just kind of moving on to the literature, and firstly, this concept of financialization I mentioned. And um, so this is very much deemed in the literature as this kind of twofold trend involving the increasing role of housing as assets in the financial system and the increasing role of financial institutions or actors in the housing market, in particular, say, you know, your local housing market, your domestic housing market. And, and the literature generally points to two, two broad periods, financialization 1.0, financialization 2.0. Now, I focus on the latter in this paper, but it's worth then um, discussing the two of them. So financialization 1.0 is generally due to be this period between the 80s or 70s, depending on, on who you read, and the, and the early 2000s, mid 2000s. And, and it relates to the mortgage-driven financialization of home ownership, uh, primarily involving households, and it's been supported by the state and universal housing regimes and the emotional market-based housing finance models, particularly um, here in Ireland, we would have saw in the early years of uh, independence. And you know, this uh, kind of state led subsidization of, um, of housing construction, of housing development. And then um, in later years, since the 80s, we would have saw, say, banks take a more prominent role in mortgage lending in, in housing development. Uh, and ultimately, in, in, in a lot of countries, uh, this is deemed to have culminated in this rapid growth in mortgage and housing markets. Um, and, and subsequently, in some countries like Ireland and Spain, the, the emergence of credit union property bubbles, which you know, subsequently burst and had. Um, massive uh, macroeconomic ramifications. Um, however, what, what the literature suggests is that financialization of housing didn't cease in the wake of the financial crisis. Rather, it's evolved. But what it's evolved into is this: is this uh, topic that I focus on this paper, financialization 2.0. So the growing role of institutional investors, these large financial companies I talked about, um, in in the private rental sector as opposed to say households trying to purchase property mm -hmm. from ownership. And then um, there's, there's two key, dr key drivers highlighted, quantitative easing, and um, particularly as, as this incentivized households to say move away from more traditional assets like government bonds, which during say the period of you know high asset purchase programs um, and the low interest rate environment in the past, which, which we, we know is now in reverse, but, but over that period, um, it, yeah, led to them moving away from those more traditional asset classes and shifting focus towards, say, riskier assets like commercial real estate, and, uh, and uh, then more recently, housing. And this has been highlighted as an important factor, both internationally and here in Ireland. Michael Byrne and UCD has done quite a bit of analysis on this. And then also the Department of Public Expenditure Reform have highlighted it in, uh, in, in some of their own reports. And additionally, the state-led de-risking of property markets. This is quite a key one for a lot of authors. Um, and really what this comes down to is Basically, policies designed to incentivize foreign capital flows, for example, in the Irish case, in, in, into trying to clean up the, the housing bubble after the crisis. And um, uh, the same in other countries like Spain, Portugal, for example. And, and specifically, the, the development of uh, real estate investment funds, or REITs, as I call them here, and real estate investment trusts. The, the design of tax frameworks, loan optimal tax frameworks, to attract that institutional investment in order to clean up those housing bubbles. So, so many of you remember, say, for example, a lot of NAMA sales 2014, 2015, 2016, which would have gone to these types of entities. Um, and, and more recently in Ireland, these policies have aimed to, or these frameworks, sorry, have aimed to uh, direct investment towards the, the, the building and the of the building. So the, the next key point that the literature is, it tends to focus on those real estate investment trusts that I mentioned. And they've been identified in a lot of countries as, as large investors. And, and there's a growing body of literature suggesting they're, they're important in, in, in others. And Waldron, for example, the Irish case has, has, has examined this. But really, there's three main reasons for their focus. Firstly, as I mentioned kind of a few minutes ago, that there's this widespread um, establishment of reach regimes across countries, particularly in Europe, since the financial crisis. And um, for example, in Ireland, we established, I think, in 2013. And Portugal would have established REIT regimes, some type of similar. Um, and then the second point is they very much epitomize this concept of housing financialization. So a real estate investment trust say will buy housing. They will um, list themselves on the stock exchange and they fund themselves through shares, which, which are listed there. And then investors can buy those shares. And what the investor is getting is 
is a financial asset, but they're getting an exposure to physical property. So in that way, it's very much this idea of housing taxation. And then the third point is the, the data of these entities is much more readily available than it is on, say, other types of institutional investors like real estate investment funds that I mentioned a minute ago. And, and that's because they are publicly listed companies. They, they publish their annual accounts, uh, and the information on them is more readily available for researchers to analyze, to compile. Uh, and as I say, few studies, by contrast, focus on other types of institutional investors. Um, and, and analysis I've done with colleagues in the Central Bank Park, for example, demonstrated that uh, real estate investment funds are actually more important than REITs in the Irish context. They own more units. Uh, and internationally, real estate investment funds, for example, are very, very prominent. Uh, I mentioned real estate investment funds here, but there's, another, there's a wide range of entities, insurance companies, pension funds, for example, US private equity firms. There's a wide range of companies who invest in housing, and um, but ultimately they're not being touched by the literature to a great extent at present. And, and uh, ultimately, this study and the, the data methods they take enable me to, to look at that wider group of, group of investors. Um, Ah, yeah, sorry. Uh, and, and then the, the, the next key point in terms of the literature is very much uh, what is quite salient in Ireland at present is the benefit and cost of these entities. So the, the, the four literature frameworks I mentioned, particularly in the last few years, have been designed to attract that institutional capital to Ireland to, to develop new units. Um, and say industry bodies like the IIP would, for example, sorry, the Irish, the Institutional Irish Property Group, who would highlight um, that, that this capital is essential for supporting heads and construction uh, but may otherwise remain undeveloped. And, and this is this is quite a, an important point because um, the, the current housing crisis with the ongoing shortage suggests that you know, there are at least 40,000 units. Or today, for example, we've heard in the news that actually this estimate is closer to about 60,000. And so 2030, as I've mentioned here, it's estimated 40 to 60,000 houses are needed until 2050. So, so this institutional capital is important. Um, and however, the ultimate issue is again, you know, the absence of, of data to, to, to analyze it. On, on the side of more kind of focus on costs and um, the literature, the growing literature, I should say, tends to focus on two to three elements. Firstly, that these, these institutional investors are impacting prices. There's studies focusing on cross country aspects on specific uh, cities, given that these investors tend to concentrate their investment in large urban cities in York, for example. And, and then, you know, there's individual country <laughs> like, like the US, what I mentioned here. And ultimately, what they all highlight is that these institutional investors are important in driving house prices, or they may be important. And on, on rents, uh, again, these, these investors are associated with rising rents. And there's a number of analysis colleagues in the ECB, uh, Walter and again for Ireland, they, they seem to highlight that these investors could be important for rent. And in the case of, say, Nemo's and Smith's, but what they tend to highlight is that because these investors buy, say, an apartment block or several apartment blocks in a given area, they could have rent setting power given that they, they, they buy such a large share in, in that particular area. Excuse me, in that particular area. Um, and ultimately, where this price and rent impacts the is is this concern about affordability, particularly if rents and, and prices are increasing at, at a pace which is faster than, than real incomes can keep up with. Uh, so, so this is where it becomes uh, very, very concerning in terms of affordability crises for households, for example. But ultimately, again, the Irish case, there hasn't really been any analysis to date which can focus on this tangibly, and, and that's ultimately because of, of the data. And um, that's, that's really what I tried to remedy in this study. And specifically, I, I developed a new database, which I call the Institutional Investment Database, the IID. And, and the source of this information is public information. So it's public transactions, uh, say reported in newspaper articles, media reports by major real estate agents like CBRE, Cushman and Wakefield, these sort of companies, and, and also major investors. Sometimes you might find, say, for example, investment funds may list some of their some perspectives documents online. You can find information on precise uh, units or properties that they purchased. And uh, the time period overall from the database is 2010 to 2021, so just over a decade. And in terms of the scope, um, it, it includes both commercial and housing, so, so both commercial property and, and residential units. And however, in this, in this analysis, I'm obviously focusing just on housing. 
for, for the commercial side, I, I only capture uh, transactions greater than five million. Um, for housing, however, I, I do capture um, transactions uh, below five million, really because the average transaction size for these units tends to be much lower than, for example, a uh, shopping center, which could be transacted for over a billion. Uh, there's, there's multiple examples of that in Ireland in, in, in recent years. Uh, and in total, the, the final database records just over uh, 780 transactions. In terms of its coverage, just important to benchmark it compared to other sources. It represents about ninety three percent of the value of transactions reported uh, by the Central Bank of Ireland, and um, for, for all real estate investments, so that's, that's for all sorts of the, sorry, all types of the real estate property. Um, but ultimately, that's that's an aggregate statistic. So so that's going to get information, for example, from real estate agents who give them an aggregate uh, estimate of the total flow in a given year. Um, but in the IID, I'm able to kind of uh, decompose that further. It's, it's much more granular. So despite being slightly having slightly less coverage or covering slight, slightly smaller uh, number of transactions, uh, it gives me a lot of detail. So specifically property by property level transaction information, and then that includes the price, each transaction, the year, the address, the property type, as I mentioned, and the buyer information, which, which is quite a critical one because this is often the hardest to come by, and um, specifically the names of investors. And, uh, and what I try to do when, when I do this is Look at the ultimate parent. Say, for example, often a, a company may be set up in Ireland to invest in property, but ultimately it's all from abroad. And actually, when you read me the articles on these transactions, they'll tend to refer to, say, a US private equity firm, even though that, that firm is actually probably using it. One of the Irish vehicles I mentioned, either a REIT or a real estate investment fund, because it's tax efficient to do so. However, for the, for the purpose of this analysis and, and giving a lot of media articles, we'll you know, the refer say to the open parent that that's what I base the ownership for transaction information. Uh, sorry, for residential transaction information, I, I I go a step further given the focus of this study, and I, and I clean this uh, using the residential property price register. Um, and and were any differences between public sources, for example, on the location and the price um, of, of the transaction, any differences between the public source and the RPPR. I, I take the information from the OPP or instead. Now, the caveat here is residential property price registers don't have its own uh, data limitations. However, I, think I, I would expect it will have a higher quality than, say, publicly uh, the important information. And um, for the residential transactions, though, I also add additional variables to the ones I listed the previous slide here. And um, I also develop the air code information. And I break down the number of units purchased in terms of say, the type of unit, if it's an apartment or a house, the number of bedrooms, whether it's an existing or, or a new unit, and the number of built for purchase versus the number, say, under construction planning commission. This is critical when you go into trying to assess the extent which these investors support me supply. And I also develop an indicator for whether this is a forward purchase support on the transactions. So that's where, for example, an investor will come in and they will buy a Say a portfolio of uh, say of apartments of, of a developer in Dublin Square ahead of its completion. So they're effectively then uh, financing it. So turn to the more interesting stuff, the, the actual results. And um, what, what you can see from these charts is on the left hand side, the total investment in I have state in general for all, all forms of property between 2010 and 2021. So, so the actual value of the transactions on the left hand side. And then this value is decomposed in terms of, say, the percentage share of each uh, property type on the right hand side. What you can see, particularly from the right hand chart, is this purple segment, the residential segment, increases dramatically from 2018 onwards. So it would suggest that since 2018, there's been a significant shift towards residential property. Now, I, I take this right hand chart and I, I break that just the housing segment here on the left hand side to really just say, uh, you know, try to. Uh, is to reinforce the, the, the extent to which this, this increases between 2017 and 2018. And there may be multiple reasons why it increases. One that's maybe often cited is that the return, the actual rents that these investors receive from residential property versus, say, other forms of property um, but was, would be uh, much better. And um, you can get a higher yield potentially of some of these units than others, and uh, particularly during the pandemic. Uh, the say the rental arrears of housing will go much lower than say for retail units. So so it may also be deemed a more stable investment type. 
um, on the right hand side, I decompose the actual uh, investment in terms of the value and the lower the purchase. So over the period uh, 2012 to 2021, just under 9 billion in, in Irish housing was purchased, and that represented about 26,000 units. Um, so it's so quite, quite a significant amount, actually. So this kind of leads us to this question of, you know, what, what are these units? Are they new units or are they existing units? Um, and, and useful to benchmark here as well, because um, again, the data on, on the supply of new units really only comes from industry. So again, I mentioned the IIP earlier on, and um, you'll see that I, I had data in 2021, and looking at what the IIP report in 2021, they suggest that there are members of about 12,000 units either under construction or planning permission in place as of May 21. But actually, when you break out the homeowners, uh, let's say the major home builders that, uh, that represent their members, um, it suggests that about 24,000 of them actually relates to institutional investors. So um, one of the findings, I go into this in more detail in the paper, but one of the findings I suggest is that it's important to, um, particularly when, when we take information, for example, like from the IIP, that, that we, we break it out in terms of home builders, versus institutional investors, because they're fundamentally different business models. One is build to sell, the other is buy to rent, notwithstanding the fact that the two of these um, can act quite closely, for example, in terms of foreign funded transactions that I mentioned, these, these institutional investors will acquire the units potentially off, um, off both major home groups. Um, so the next slides here present the actual decomposition of the investment in terms of existing versus new builds. And um, you'll see that really up until 2017, the majority of investment, both in terms of the value of that investment in the left-hand share and the number of units purchased in the right-hand share, and um, really up until 2017, existing units dominate. And over the entire period, in fact, existing units um, just slightly outweigh purchases of new units. So it's about 13 and a half thousand for existing versus about 12 and a half for new units. And um, you really only see from 2020 that new builds start to dominate. In 2018 and 2019, while the investment in new units increases significantly, and um, it's still about 50 billion. Another point here to mention on the new builds is that roughly, according to the, the data, approximately two thirds of those new builds are either under construction or, or were in the planning stage when, when they were acquired. So that means that, say, if you look at 2021, it's possible some of that green bar hasn't actually been delivered. So that's just an important caveat here that the number of purchases doesn't equal the number of completions, say. And um, additionally, that new segment, approximately 10% of, say, that just the, the new builds in general over the period, approximately 10% of those were bought from, from Glen Bay and from Cairn, so the two major home builders here in Ireland. So there's, you know, you can have another debate on this as to whether those properties could be could be acquired by homeowners instead of institutional investors. That's a separate debate, but to support the highlights that suggest, you know, when you kind of take that out, maybe the extent of new supply actually being acquired by institutional investors isn't as strong as you might expect. And um, but I'll come back to that point later on. And um, so so where is the institutional property actually located? So colloquial evidence again, you'll be reading media for the Irish Times on this will suggest the stuff, but again, we haven't been able to actually show this uh, until now. So zooming in further on Dublin, and you see that it's concentrated uh, very much in the city centre, but at the same time, you know, there's quite a good distribution around Dublin County as a whole. Um, you see clusters, for example, Santry, Tala, uh, and the city west area, Sandyford in particular. Um, but it's actually when you weight it in terms of value that you really see these clusters. So you see a lot of investment, say, down in Keys, Dublin 1, Dublin 2, particularly around Dublin 8. Again, you see Sandy for coming out quite strongly. John Leary, for example, those kind of clusters in Santry, for example, like I mentioned as well. And um, so, you know, even though it's concentrated in Dublin, there do appear to be clusters. And this is important that when we think about price and rental dynamics later on, as it could be the case, these investors are more important in certain areas in Dublin than in others. And you wage it in terms of units. The same, the same story comes out, um, although say areas like Tala, um, for example, you, you can kind of see these dynamics at average prices, the, the, the clusters, the, the size of the nodes, sorry, say in Dunleary are much smaller than say they were in terms of value, and equally in Tala in terms of value, 
then the actual uh, the nodes are quite small, but here they're, they're much bigger. Um, but again, the overall, this, the same kind of clusters play out. So you do see these concentrations around double and age, double one and two, sandy third of the year, et cetera. Um, so again, I'll, I'll come back to this later when I talk about the impact of prices and rents potentially, um, but, but ultimately, um, in, it's, it's, it's a very important uh, point. So who are the institutional investors? And this is maybe an element that people might be most interested in. So there's quite a distribution, mainly Irish, according to the data. But the, the caveat here is that actually a lot of this Irish relates to what I talked about when I spoke about the data methodology. A lot of these Irish companies will actually be ultimately owned from abroad. So maybe institutional capital, actually, but, but, but it's not actually possible to decompose the ultimate ownership in these cases. But, but it's just it's important to flag this. You can see that in earlier years, particularly 2013, 14, 15, a US events are more important. And um, this kind of reflects very much, say, the role of those more speculative investors in the early years buying, buying uh, property of NAMA, for example. And you can see that after the shift that I mentioned to housing from very much from 2018 onwards, there, you get this little, uh, how do you put it? You, you get a, a, a wider investor base and such. There, there's more European investors coming in there, particularly German, UK, uh, and Dutch investors. And I should say this, this red segment, this other segment, relates to transactions where the, the actual purchaser is in detail in, in the sources. So, so we can't get information on, say, the, the country or, or, or the investor type, for example. And you can see it's, it's actually quite considerable in, in some of the more recent years. In terms of the, the buyer type, it's, it's kind of a similar story. Is this uh, orange segment, real estate investment funds, ties in very closely to the Irish segment on the previous chart. So these are, say, investment funds set up in Ireland, ultimately owned from abroad, but it's just not possible to decompose them. And you can see the private equity, this kind of gold segment is quite important. And then real estate investment trusts over time are pretty important. So on the screen segment, but actually the screen segment really just relates to one entity, IRS reach, and, and I'll discuss them a bit more later on. Again, the uh, the red area here is, is these companies. This, sorry, the, the other here is uh, is the segment where we just kind of identify who, who, who the investor is. There's no details. And um, so what I do is I take those those first two charts and, and, and I, I create a matrix with those. So to get a better idea of actually where, where the major investment sectors are. So you can see from this chart that US private equity investors, so that one four seven eight million, so 1.5 billion, and they're, they're the largest investor group as such in Irish uh, residential property uh, over the 10 or over the 10 year period show. Then you can see, for example, German real estate investment funds and Irish REITs. Again, this Irish REIT is just, it's just one entity, it's IRS REIT. And um, so you can see there's Three, three large groups, and then just to flag those two orange uh, cells in the top left, the Irish real estate investment company, the Irish private equity companies, again, these are companies which are most likely funded from abroad, so they're probably not really Irish companies. Um, and you can do the same breakdown then in terms of units. So you see the, the US, um, US private equity firms, and there, there's a relatively small group of players here, but they, they have the, the the most units, uh, basically, of, of any of the other groups. This is followed by Irish REITs, again, yeah, one entity really. Um, and then you can see kind of the Irish REITs that investment fund and the Irish private equity groups again coming out here as, as important. And uh, the other location and other sectors, this is again the same, same group where there just isn't information on, on who, is, who is the investment. Is. So uh, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting because you're able to break down the, the names of the investors and see who the major investors in Irish property, <laughs> Irish housing, sorry, have been in the, in the past decade or so. And uh, the first thing really I want to highlight here is, is the relatively small group involved. It's quite a concentrated number of investors. And you can see that these top 20 investors represent about three quarters of all investment in Irish, uh, sorry, institutional investment in Irish housing uh, over the 10 over the 10 year period. Um, and this is again important when you think about say dynamics to do with rents, potentially set rents. If it's a smaller group of investors, maybe that potentially increases. Um, and I should say that when you take just the top 10, it's about 50%. So it's kind of the same there. Then there's there's 
very different entities. So what, well, there's quite a long list here that's relatively, relatively different entities. So IRA is, for example, and the largest institutional landlord in the state, where you can see um, in the last two columns uh, with, with the red, uh, the red uh, sorry, highlight in red, um, you can see that a lot of their investment is second half. So the extent to which these investors are providing new supply is, is questionable. And equally, Kennedy Wilson, uh, large US private equity firm, they've been active in the Irish market for many years now. And it, it, it's, it's really the same story here. But, but if you look at other investor types, um, particularly these ones highlighting gray with, with red around them, um, the, these are a very interesting case. And they're actually very unexpected finding when I, when I went into the analysis. These are all uh, Irish companies which receive a mix of public funding from the Irish Strategic Investment Fund, which is managed by the NTMA, so it's public funding, um, and, and private funding. And they seem to represent a disproportionate amount of the new supply being provided by these companies or saving new bills being acquired. And if, if you put it as well, let's say the total top 20, um, say, purchases of new bills over the years, that 9,930 down the bottom, they represent about a third of that. Um, or, or they represent about a quarter of, of the total investment in new bills over the entire period, shown so that 12,500. Um, and so this kind of raises questions about, well, what, what are the, say, solely private funded investors doing? What do they represent? Because they're ultimately the investors being targeted by policies that are in place at the moment, say, real estate investment trust, real estate investment trust, will not more tax, uh, tax structures, are really set up and designed to attract institutional capital and in more recent years, as I mentioned, to, to, to provide new supply. So I, I just got kind of going back to the earlier point about say the new units and existing units. This is the breakdown of say the total units purchased from 2012 to 21 and then from 2018 to 2021. So that period where there is a shift very much to housing. And really what it shows is that if you exclude the existing units purchased by all investors, um, and then you exclude, say, new units acquired by publicly backed investors that are just highlighted, so that's say 3,312. Then you say take away those units that were acquired from Car in Glen Bay that I mentioned a few minutes ago as well. You get this residual at the very end of about 8,300 units. And it's these units that have been solely, solely say, purchased by 100% um, private finance companies. And that actually only represents about 32%. Of all the investment of these companies over, over the period shown over the 2012 2021 period. If you, if you focus on the period, say, where there's this clear shift towards housing, 2018 onwards, it's slightly bigger, it's about 40%. But ultimately, what it suggests is that their, their role in providing new supply, particularly those privately funded companies, um, seems smaller than, than at least I would have expected um, in Barton and other projects. So, so there's quite a lot in this. Uh, in this slide here I'm focusing on the, the role of rising house prices, the role of these institutions potentially, you know, how, how would they impact those prices? Are they, are they large enough to impact house prices? Do they have markets, enough market shares? So really what I, what I want to focus on are these two areas highlighted in pink and red. So the area highlighted in pink, um, what this presents is the percentage of the institutional investment as proportion of the CSOs and um, data on all purchases in Dublin. So this is just Dublin, it's not national. If you look at the national level, it's insignificant. It's, you get a figure of about 1% of the total, 2% of the total investment by all investor types. That's households, non-households, etc. And um, but, but here what you see is that the institutional share of all investment in housing in Dublin from 2018 onwards seems to increase. So in 2018, it's only 4%, but then to 2019, 13%, for example, in terms of the number of units at the top. And then if you look at the bottom, um, the, the value of yours. But again, focused on that 2018 to 2021 period, what you see is that almost 10% of both the number of units transacted or the value of those units um, has been has been bought, or sorry, relates basically to institutional investments. So almost uh, one in 10 purchases over that period relate to institutional investments. And that's in Dublin as a whole. And so that's somewhat significant in itself. But, if you focus on, a, on an air code level, um, the, the institutional investment here is more significant in some areas of Dublin than others. And um, caveat here is that I'm only able to compare institutional investment to household investment at an air code level. It's not possible yet that the data just isn't there. 
to look at all, all purchases at variable level. So that's an important caveat. So really what this is, is a proportion of institutional investment being the households, not being the all, all market purchases. But what you see is, um, and it relates back to the earlier map, map charts basically on, um, on the, the, the investor concentration by area. So that kind of, you, I mentioned Dublin 1, Dublin 2, Dublin 8, and they come out here again. And if you focus on the gold bars, you can see that the, the institutional share of the number of units required is quite significant in some areas. So say if we focus on Dublin 1, the very start of the graph, you can see that um, in terms of the percentage of the number of units required, institutional investors represented 40% of the level of investment for households. So that suggests, say, that for, for every 10 units acquired by a household, an additional four are acquired by an institutional investor in Dublin 1. And then you can kind of read them in the, the same from, the, from some of the other areas. And uh, there's quite a few there that have, say, above that 10% average I mentioned in the previous slide. So there's, I think, nine, 10 air codes where for the share of investment in terms of units over the period is about 20%. So again, it kind of kind of gets to this point that if, if they have a large enough share of investment, it, it, there is potential that they could impact the prices. The, the next question that I, that I mentioned at the beginning was, well, what's the potential to say, you know, impact on rents? And the way I try to measure this in the analysis is by looking at their share of the rental stock. So what I do here is I, I kind of accumulate their investment over time. Um, so say for that census 2016 comparison, what I do is I, I add up the number of units purchased by these investors between 2012 and 2016. So that gives me the estimate of 6,901 for 2016. The assumption here is that they don't sell them all, which is quite a feasible one given that uh, the database does capture any resales uh, and also that um, these are very much kind of buy to rent entities. They're not buying these to flip them later on. So if you compare that to the private rental stock from the census 2016, it suggests that in 2016, they held about 6% of Dublin's rental, uh, private rental stock. And um, if you compare it to uh, an estimate of the private rental stock from 2019, it suggests an estimate of closer to 12%. And then I, I estimate the private rental stock based on the total stock um, for, for census 2022, and that suggests 17%. However, given this is more of a kind of a guesstimate, I also estimated the lower barrier for 2022, which is where I, I also had in vacant units in Dublin on top of that. And that would still suggest approximately 14%, which I think myself is probably too low. Um, and, and hopefully as the final census figures come through, I'll be able to do this uh, 2022 calculation more accurately. However, what it does suggest is that, you know, their share of the rental stock, private rental stock in Dublin has grown considerably in the past six to seven years. Um, and that they could be playing an increasing role in, in driving rents. Um, so some of the key takeaways, I'm conscious I've shown a lot of charts and a lot of uh, data heavy tables there. So uh, I think it's useful to recap and just kind of look at what the key takeaways are. So firstly, uh, some of the first charts I showed, but what they really demonstrate is this concept of financialization 2.0, the shift by institutional investors to housing, seems to be very visible in Ireland, particularly from 2018 onwards. And additionally, the concentration of investment in Dublin um, and its growing importance relative to other buyers. And as I showed a few minutes ago, and um, certain Dublin air codes suggest that these institutional investors could play a role in preventing uh, uh, market prices for households or cyber housing. Um, Additionally, the growing share of the rental stock, as I've just demonstrated, and the dominance of the relatively small group of investors um, suggest that they could also have the potential to impact upon rates. And then finally, um, their role in supporting the supply, um, that's subject, as I showed, to, to multiple nuances. Firstly, they only seem to really dominate, sorry, new units only seem to dominate from 2020 onwards or 2018. It's very much focused on the existing stock. And then additionally, as I kind of showed, if you take away the existing units, the units are purchased by publicly backed investors, and then units acquired from Karen and Glen Bay, um, their, their significance appears to be much less than I expected. And ultimately, why is this all important? Well, on the one hand, it suggests that the benefits of these investors in supporting new supply may be more evident than previously expected. And that raises important considerations regarding the effectiveness of uh, existing policy in directing institutional capital towards developing new housing supply. 
and given the, the disproportionate share of the number of new units provided uh, by those property back companies so those four entities i showed if but i wonder if then um, further say development of those types of avenues of investments in public private partnership in that sense yield more effective uh, provision of new supply um, and on the other hand then um, you know the costs associated with institutional investment what seems to be their potential rising growth impact on prices and rents um, suggests that they could uh, potentially exacerbate say our, our ongoing affordability crisis um, given that the uh, incomes have uh, stayed relatively flat and um, ultimately though however you know I, I highlight particularly say with regard to rents and prices I highlight this kind of market impact potentially these are very much correlations they're not causality so it's an important caveat and so I'm, I'm not say proving in a sense that they are in fact the prices but put it but it's an important start and the key idea here is to kick off the debate and such and um, but ultimately yeah that there needs to be further analysis to, to kind of confirm these trends if indeed uh, they are current questions thank you very much um thank you very much um um, so we'll take questions if you're online just uh, raise your hand on the zoom and i'll take questions from the floor i'm a little nervous that the actual mics are up here so it would be a good idea you can shout or do you want to come up so, oh, yeah. uh, first, uh, <laughs> no, i'll go first uh, and uh if you can give your name and affiliation for the record that'd be great sure of course um, Am I close up the microphone? Yeah, you're good at that. Um, so my name is Colin Motor, and I work with GoodBuddy. And I run the property desk. So we have obviously been involved in particularly injecting a lot of the analysis as well. So thank you, Piers, for that. It's really interesting to see someone else doing work on this as well and building a database. Because we built a similar institutional database over the years. We try to understand the sector. And so a couple of questions, maybe one observation, which I think is very interesting, is the big issue we've had with this sector, and Irish property going back 30, 40 years had, is the lack of data. It's one of the most opaque property markets in Europe. And because of that, you know, that's obviously scared away traditionally institutional investment. If we look what happened post 2008, 2009, this institutionalization of commercial, then residential injected transparency. You and Jones Lang, one of the agents, produced a very interesting transparency index, which saw Ireland move from sort of the top 25, which is around the level of Greece, right way up to the second most transparent market in the world. Um, and because of that, publicly available information. Now, that's obviously driven by the fact you've got the report, which is very welcome. It also drives other investors. But once you have transparency, others come in. So I thought it was very interesting to see the comments around that. I think it's very welcome. Um, I have a couple of questions. Just one, did the data set break up single family units versus multiple family units? So, no, it, it's not really structured around that. So, so the way it's structured in, in the way I can gather the data is, say, for example, often the public sources will list, say, the, the size of the units, the characteristics. So I don't present that here, but uh, I'm able to break it down, say, for example, in terms of if it's a two bed, three bed, four bed apartment, so we kind of break down. Unfortunately, the information isn't very clear from, from the analysis, but in general, it would be referenced in the actual reports. It's large multi family units, say, apartment blocks, for example, because ultimately the, the majority of these investments do pertain to apartments. Okay, and taking that a step further then, so one of the things I thought was interesting or unusual, and I want to sort of question on it, is you in the analysis you excluded Karen and Glenn Bay the units. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's very much to kind of uh, really to, to, to raise these kind of questions. So when I looked at some of those units that were acquired, and um, the larger debate would say some of the developments, if I say Karen Glenn Bay, or particularly around apartments, is the price and if it's feasible, say for household supplies, and if there's the demand there, uh, more importantly for, for the household supplies. Um, and when I looked at in some of the cases, prices weren't that dramatically out of step with, say, prices you might see for two, three, four bed houses in Kildare or, or other areas. Now, I don't have that data broken down, but really it was this, this question about would households in say a period when they can't get on the housing ladder, would they be willing to try, would they buy those properties, say directly from the parent of the bay, instead of them selling them to institutional investors? Now, it's completely open for debate, but that's partly why I exclude, partly to, uh, to kind of 
uh, probe these exact questions. And it's interesting because when you think about, you know, let's say about 930, 40 units excluded there about. Yes, yeah, so, so, so there's 1,200 in total, but one of those publicly backed entities represent about two, two, 250 of those. So when you exclude those rather than public care, basically you get down to so roughly just yeah, under those there. Those kind of, about 800 of those 930 units were not ever going to be viable for the individual. Now, there's a couple where they're single family. That's why the definition between a single family house, which there was some of that care, and then the next is the multi family is quite important. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Really interesting to see the transparency. Well done. Thanks for that. Thanks for your questions. Samir, do you want to try um, coming in online? Yeah. Hi, can I be heard? Here. Uh, I can. Am I? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, perfect. Hi, uh, Piers. My name is Samir Sheikh. I'm currently an associate economist within the central bank. Obvious disclaimer, all views are my own. Uh, don't represent the bank. The two questions I have just from previous research, because I used to work um, as a research assistant within Trinity Trillion Alliance, and our focus was much more on the rental market, was one, does the institutional investor database that you've collected exclude the number of units that have been sold to affordable housing bodies or city councils in the form of like part five or social housing? Because uh, that data is really hard to find, uh, but there has been like increased transparency from the local councils through like monthly reports in those kind of transactions. That's the first question. Yeah, so um, I actually do capture some of those purchases, but as you say, um, I think partly because they're not the same, maybe they don't get picked up in the media. As they, but yeah, I, I do capture some transactions from, uh, say, for example, Double City Council. Um, yeah, as you say, the approved housing bodies. But on the whole, it's, it's, it's quite small um, when you compare it to, to yeah, the institutions. And I don't have the breakouts, but, but I'm happy to, uh, to discuss them with you afterwards and maybe show you some questions. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And um, I think. I had something else in mind, but we can probably discuss it afterwards. Um, I don't think it's necessarily important here, but thank you for the presentation. It's really useful. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I'm encouraging people to come up to the front so people online can definitely hear their questions. So I'm sorry. Well, uh, Durham Tolerian, the chief economist, a good buddy, <laughs> but also chairing um, a working group on, on the Housing Commission on financing so this is really relevant and really really important stuff and um, one of the, the, the points i'll make in relation follow on from column was on this point about uh, separating the two plc's i mean one of the things that they think about when they're mm -hmm. deciding to build a particular type of unit or or or, or development is is the funding structure and the return on that and the risk obviously of that development um so so in some cases, they may not may decide not to buy the land to build that unit if the, if the return doesn't work and if the risk is too high, and um, perhaps it wouldn't be built in the first place. And that, that that's that's kind of just a point on that separation. Um, kind of a, a, a follow on on that, I suppose, in, in relation to and I put a question for you. Um, you're making the point that um, you know, if you look at the, the, the share coming from this particular source in your database. It's a sufficiently high proportion to suggest that it may have an impact on demand and price, and it may have an impact on price of a rent, I should say, in, in, in a particular uh, area. Um, but, but the flip side is, it, 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 if that investment is not there to pre fund, and then the supply is not there as well. So maybe just comment on, on, on that aspect of it in, in terms of the supply. So, so I, I think this is very much where the, the point around correlation versus causality comes in. Because, yeah, you obviously have these other exogenous kind of factors where, yeah, there, there's a supply shortage. And if you don't have that supply coming on stream, then our price is going to go up. And I think that's the point you're making. Um, but equally, I think, you know, you, a sizable amount of the purchases now, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, say in Dublin or specific areas, how much of that is new units versus existing units. But indeed, you know, a lot of the purchases over time period the existing. And a lot of the new units that have been purchased, you mentioned two thirds of those were only under development at the time of purchase. Um, but no, I, 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 I do take your point 
with regard to public structure and the importance of that, because it, it's a very well known point that Cairn, Glen Bay, other home builders, even where they do not receive direct, say, financing for project by an institutional investor, they may only embark on that under the expectation that the institutional investor will, will purchase it. So no, it's, it's a very, very fair point. It's up for, it's one of these points for debate. It's very much why I, I, I broke them out because, again, yeah, if you look at the prices for some of them, and uh, maybe this is a follow up piece of work to, to see what the prices of those units are relative to, say, the average market price. And indeed, if indeed it is unfeasible, say, for households to purchase those units and those institutional investors, I think that's maybe something interesting to look at it. My kind of uh, my clarity, I would say, yeah, some of these points, yeah. Pat Paul, you know, Paul Sweeney, member of the society. Um, it seems to me that the state is acting in conflicting ways on housing policy. I suppose everyone needs to do that. I was just thinking you mentioned that through NTMA's um, IFI, as the, oh, yes, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's investing in these companies, um, and these companies are competing against first-time buyers and maybe bidding on house prices. The state gave tax breaks to OREITs and OREIFs, which one could argue is the right thing to do after the crisis, but they should have been cut off. They've been cutting off tax breaks out for a while. The state is, through its local authorities, is buying houses from perhaps these builders and other speculators, and stopping first-time buyers from buying them as well. And of course, the state is not building directly in the amount it, it did in the past. And on that very point, but its history now, they privatized a vast amount of public stock and, and give discounts. This really offends me up to 60% to those who are in the very fortunate position to purchase like same houses. So our health, public housing stock is, is a fraction of what it should be. But uh, it's the role of the state generally. If you to, is it walking forwards and backwards and sideways? Well, I, I think specifically what's focused on here, I, I actually think it's somewhat the opposite. I, I think the state policy is relatively aligned. In, in terms of, say, specifically this study, say if you exclude, say, the point to make rent, privatization of public stock, say, for tenant repurchase schemes and that kind of stuff. Exclude those points. Um, if you look at the real estate investment trusts that have been set up, the REITs that have been set up, yeah, they're very tax efficient schemes. But then what the, what the NTMA and ISIF is also doing is it's actually partaking in, say, one of those real estate investment fund structures. So it, it's almost like a double whammy. So you have the initial entity, and then the NTMA's uh, fund is also invested in that. And ultimately, the overall goal of both is to try and boost housing supply to, to kind of direct institutional capital towards housing supply. So I actually think, I, I take your points, but I actually think that it's sort of a double whammy, actually, that the, the policy, at least when it comes to what I focus on here in the paper in terms of those investors, it's actually all being directed um, to, to try and bring in institutional capital. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, John. Um, Campus Gerald. Even uh, 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 they probably do have a, a, an impact on price, your know, increased demand as well as increasing supply. Um, but in terms of rents, um, given that they buy them to rent, there is presumably an increase in supply to rent at a time when many other landlords are pulling out. Would they have an, uh, a, 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 as a result, keep a lead on rents or, or reduce rents? Or what, how do you see their impact on rents? So there, there's a number of studies um, which focus on the investors and on the rental dynamics. So one interesting one from Berlin suggests that rents go up where these investors are present. And a lot of studies suggest, suggest this, but this one from Berlin is particularly interesting because they say, well, actually, the, the rent goes up because the quality of the units is higher compared to, say, the, the small-scale landlord, private stock, say, you know, like student accommodation, um, which, which might not be at the highest quality, this kind of thing. Um, but no, it's, it's an important point as to whether or not 
you know, I'm presenting here that they're increasing as a proportion of the private stock. But as you rightly point out, particularly in the last years, maybe a lot of smaller scale private landlords are taking their properties off the market and selling them. It, it's sort of it, so if you policy control the rents, mm -hmm. are they reducing rent? Like, all right, and what you're saying is they build higher quality products. So the building resources go into that rather than into uh, smaller apartments are. Yeah, well, well they, they have the capital to do it. I think this is the point. They have the capital to provide higher quality units. And um, as opposed to say a small scale landlord, you can't quite use them. Maybe that's part of your effect on the rent. It's, it's the question, I suppose, that gets raised as to whether if the rent of the average rent pertaining to these investors leads to smaller scale investors also increasing their rent as a consequence. Um, more towards say more of the market average. But again, so, so this is where this is very much a first stage kind of study. It's trying to create some data in the area. It doesn't answer all these questions. And these are all very, very important questions. And some, some of the others have raised them as well. And um, that's kind of more getting into kind of yeah, that kind of also kind of studies, trying to identify causal identification, you know, because there's multiple factors going on at once. If indeed, say, you know, the, the actual private rental stock is falling. What's the impact once you control for yeah, those control factors? The private rent, or you know, certainly those small scale landlords, their share of the stock of that's dropping. Um, but overall, you know, if you just take the high level stats, suggest their overall role is, is increasing. So based on that, maybe you can compare the, the average rent and the consequence. Maybe driven more by that increase. Uh, but again, it needs to be much, yeah, need much more uh, investigation. Uh, uh, you, you, you highlighted the role of the um, public grade support that uh, institutional investors um, is there any reason that they have maybe is there any reason they have better impact in the market than other yes so no no it's, it's an interesting question that's what I thought about as well because um I don't have the figures on the actual share of the investment in the individual vehicles, say that the public public piece uh, represents. So, you know, is it like a 50-50 split? Is it say 80% private, 20% public split? But, but I wonder what comes out from it is that the sheer their sheer presence um, seems to it, it seems to play out in some manner that those entities which have some form of public funding, whether it's five percent or fifty percent seem to have a disproportionate role in the overall purchase of new units. Um, I'm not sure exactly why that is. Is, is it, say, the, the underlying prospectus and say for those, those entities that when they're established, the agreement in the beginning is that they'll solely, say, try and invest in, in new units as opposed to maybe other institutional capital, which, um, say, doesn't have that public policy behind it, where, you know, they're, they're purely going into the market for uh, Say general investment in housing, they're not maybe as worried as whether it's new or or, or existing. But um, yeah, it, it's another one of these points that that would definitely be delved into further. Uh, Donald, Donald, you want to have a go? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, Chairperson. Uh, thanks, uh, Pierce, for that very interesting presentation and great to see such good research in the area, which is, as, as you've pointed out and Colm uh, and Dermot have pointed out, it's much needed uh, to bring some clarity to the market. Um, I, I have one question, which I'll get to in a sec. I, I would make the point that what we, we've been involved in, in a number of the transactions on the institutional side and we've been involved through from kind of project initiation through to the sale um, and in some cases the management of, of some of these projects. What we've seen is that it's a case and it was referred to in, in, in your presentation. Many of the projects that we have seen in the market probably wouldn't have gone ahead if it wasn't for the institutional investment vehicles that are there and the way they can actually put up the capital to fund these projects that it, the market is totally different from what we saw in the 1990s and early 2000s. So I think that's that's important to see. And that's why I don't think they compete necessarily directly with first time buyers. Um, and also, um, I just think it, it's a case that those projects wouldn't have happened. Uh, in, 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 and if you look at, say, the prices of some of the projects, if you're looking at a North City development, 
where an institutional purchaser has paid, say, 370000 this is historic, say, four or five years ago, for an apartment, there's no way a first-time buyer would be able to afford that viability level in terms of getting that scheme going, even if you had a bunch of them together. Um, my, 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 my point in relation to, I think, Colm's point in relation to the rents, or maybe it was Dermot's point, and how it, it, I think you need to see the good side and how the demand actually is positive in terms of rent. But I totally, I take your point on board there in terms of other studies. It is higher quality stock that's been delivered. So naturally that's going to be more expensive. My question is just in relation to um, the likes of Kennedy Wilson who come and buy a site and develop them uh, themselves and then manage it in their own platform. Is that included in your stats or is that is that separate? Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It is. Um, it, the issue with those purchases is that yeah, we see the initial purchase price, and um, what you don't see is a refurbishment cost, for example, you know, or, or kind of development costs on top of the initial purchase price. And um, but yeah, no, I, I I do I capture those units in here. So, so they would, for example, have been say I think Kennedy Wilson acquired the Island Bridge site. Uh, I don't remember the name exactly, but uh, yeah, I think that about several hundred units there. So they would all be captured in the, in the database as new units, yeah. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, thanks very much, Chris. No, I was just wondering if you can learn anything from that facial sort of distribution across building, whether that is telling you anything more. Is there anything to learn about well, neighbors and investors? Yeah, for, first it was to do it out of interest, and um, just to see actually where it's located. And um, I thought then, yeah, it was relevant Say, for example, when you look at the air codes. So, so those clusters do seem to line up very closely with those increased, uh, say, that the share as a portion of um, the household transactions in the air code level. What would be very interesting, I think, is if you could compare that against all, all investor types, because, yeah, focusing just against households um, may be more relevant for areas such as Dublin 8 than, say, Dublin 1 or Dublin 2, say, you know, IFSC areas where there's a lot more office space, retail units, and then as a result, there's been a lot more institutional capital uh, devoted to, to building uh, new units there. But I think it would be very interesting, yeah, on the whole, to uh, hopefully maybe in the future, the CSO will expand their data set and you'll actually be able to compare against all buyer types. But um, no, ultimately, it, it's very much the focus was to try and look at the concentration and then take that a step further and see yeah, what their, say, market wage was. In those particular areas. And do you get a sense of what's motivating with the investors to invest in those particular areas? And is it in line with, with other investors in more than um, it's just where they can build the partners? So, so to a certain extent, it say you know, it's, probably, it's probably that as well. I, I think Dublin is well known for having say quite a constrained amount of space in terms of new development. And um, so I actually think this analysis might have relevance for say urban planning. Uh, Say it's still urban planning as well, other sort of science areas. But um, it, it's actually it's actually very hard to see from the data. If, if there's well, what the underlying logic is too. I think it was around the years, you know, there's a lot of data in different areas. And for example, planners will have data on this sort of information as well from them, um, from say uh, planning permission submissions, stuff like that, um, which which would delve maybe into those kind of questions a bit further. But I think that's ultimately the issue in this space. Say, for example, CSO with data on some stuff, Central Bank with data on some stuff, industry groups with data on something, planners with data. But ultimately, you know, in my opinion, needs to be consolidated to a certain extent to try and answer these points. Because in this paper, I've tried to cover actually quite a bit, you know, quite a few different questions at a high level. And there's a lot of nuances underneath the questions that you pose, Colin, you know, that you pose as well to others. And um, that, that's just not possible either to get the answers from in this analysis or, uh, or yet to take further. So I think there's, there's a need, as I mentioned, for further analysis into these kind of areas. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Frank McNamara. Uh, I'm a county councillor and I'm also a solicitor. And uh, my question is Have you done a similar study with regard to planning applications in terms of? How many institutional investors make planning applications? How large will planning applications? How many units would sit in a particular planning application? And how much land 
do their own in and around Dublin, let's say, and all the wider country, because um, but from what I understand, there's an awful lot of land that is owned by them, and there's an awful lot of planning applications that are passed and then lapsed, and then they do them again and so on. That'd be interested if you do any work on that. No, no, that's that's the short answer. I haven't. Um, I, I have. I did look at some planning applications during the process to try and get a sense of, say, the number of units in the breakdown. Um, but beyond that, um, no, but it's, it's very interesting. Um, indeed, some of them do own land. And some of those purchases might be captured in the data set, for example, where they buy maybe a development site. Um, but, but you haven't developed yet. So I wouldn't have categorized that as residential, um, for example. Um, yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, so I have just one question. I don't, don't know whether this makes sense, but um, in terms of uh, competition policy, I'm just thinking from a renter's point of view, um, concentration of ownership along clusters, like you did an analysis in Dublin, but maybe along kind of Lewis routes and kind of bus routes and things, just to say, well, is there a fair and open competition for rent? Like, so is there too much concentration of ownership, uh, you know, Yes. Is that, is, does it come under competition law? Has it never been brought up? Um, I, think, I think these applications do get assessed by the Consumer uh, Competition Authority. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, no, they, they, they do get assessed. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is to what extent they have the information of in to, to accurately say assesses, but I imagine they have all the previous applications which have been submitted or, um, yeah. you know, the bill. So, it's, it's a reasonable question. I'm just not sure to the extent which they wouldn't have the information available to do that correctly. It's also the other point, which others have mentioned that we have a severe, severe supply shortage. So, sure. Do we take what we can get kind of, uh, kind of approach? Sure, but competition is just a way yeah. of, of ensuring the supernormal rents are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, and that's ultimately why, why I raise as well the fact that it is a relatively small mm -hmm. group of investors because analysis by colleagues in ECB did show that um, these investors can set rents sure. um, to a certain extent. Yeah. yeah. Samir, I think you remembered your second question. Yeah. Um, it's, so the question I wanted to ask or actually to add to some of the discussion that's happened in the past few questions it's kind of a lot of it has touched on financing and the financing of this supply especially from the institutional perspective just to go off from the very last question that just happened there in terms of competition policy just to add to that specifically for special housing developments but specifically the environmental protection agency as well as transport for ireland would also be involved in some of those planning permissions when it's near Lewis line, specifically because they would ask those, the yeah, onboard planola to also contribute to development charges for like the constructor to fund, say, um, new investment into his own. So that's probably one uh, interesting point just to add there. But my question uh, for you, Pierce, um, getting to it is on the basis of the data that you show that there's been a lot more investment into new supply in the past three or four years. Do you have a breakdown, maybe not off the top of your head, um, of how many of these are forward purchased and forward funded? Because it seems to me from looking at news reporting on rental supply specifically, that these seem to be planning applications that are accepted and granted. And then there is a institutional investor that ends up forward funding these developments. So this goes off of um, comments made by uh, McDonald and also reporting by Hook and McDonald and CBRE about equity financing into these developments and kind of the risks associated with that is probably also important in a high inflation environment. Yeah, so um, Samir, over, over the entire period, approximately two thirds of the new builds are um, for purchases. I, I have a split as well in terms of whether they are under construction or with permission in place at the time of purchase. I don't, I don't know the figures for that off the top of my head. But um, for 2018 to 2021, I, I think it's relatively consistent with that two thirds as well. So that period when there's when there's been a significant shift. Yeah. That's that's amazing. Um just to, just to comment on that. And that probably could also show that again, financing of these developments is a really, really important and specific issue, um, based off of like comments that have been made before. Yeah. 
Okay, so I think um, I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to present Pierce with his medal. Um, so I don't know, I should get maybe a photo. Right. So, congratulations, And this won't even pay for one month's mortgage, or one yeah. month's mortgage. but it's still in the thousands. So, are we doing one round? Yeah, so we also have Paul Vergara. And you're Paul. Oh, yeah. So we had two uh, Barnes medals that we couldn't, we wanted to present in person. And during COVID, obviously, we weren't, we're online. So, Paul? Yeah. Um, so, this is the 22 winner. Can you remind me of the paper? Find the size and things to look at population density. Oh, yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so I'll close the meeting. Uh, thanks very much for coming, and uh, it'll be up on our YouTube channel so uh, people can uh, see the papers and proceedings of today. And next time, when are we meeting again? Next meeting is March 23rd, and I'm sending an invite for that as well. So March 23rd, and that's about the leaving cert. Yeah. Leaving cert points. Okay. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you Thank next you. time. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for everyone online. Uh, <laughs>